Good morning. Bobby, please read the problem, and Bo, please translate. Flippin' physics. 0 0.100 kilogram and 0 0.200 kilogram masses hang from either side of a frictionless pulley with a rotational inertia of 0 0.0137 kilograms times meters squared and radius of 0 0.0385 meters. Mass 1 equals 0 0.100 kilograms. Mass 2 equals 0 0.200 kilograms. The rotational inertia of the pulley equals 0 0.0137 kilograms times meters squared. The radius of the pulley equals 0 0.0385 meters. A, what is the angular acceleration of the pulley? B, what is the force of tension in each string? Part A, angular acceleration equals question mark. Part B, force of tension one and force of tension two both equal question mark. If the rotational inertia of the pulley is 0 0.0137 kilograms times meters squared, what about those spiky things sticking out of the pulley? Should we not include the rotational inertia of those as well? Uh, you were here last time, right? 0 0.0137 kilograms times meters squared is the rotational inertia of the whole thing with the spokes. It, yeah, we determined that last time. Are you okay? Yeah, um, I remember now. Thanks. Billy, please begin solving the problem. Let's draw free body diagrams. Uh, the pulley has a force of gravity acting down at its center of mass and a force normal up at the same location. The pulley also has two forces of tension acting down on it, one on each side. Let's have force of tension one point towards mass one and force of tension two point towards mass two. Mass one has a force of gravity one down and an upward force of tension one, which has the same magnitude as the force of tension one, which acts down on the pulley. Uh, mass 2 has the equivalently named forces only with subscripts of 2 instead of 1. Uh, hold up. Shouldn't the two forces of tension on either side of the pulley be the same? It is just a single string, so the force of tension in any part of the string should be the same, right? Bo, well, I do understand that it is the same string. However, because the pulley has mass and therefore rotational inertia, it takes a net torque to angularly accelerate the pulley, and therefore these two tension forces on either side of the pulley cannot be the same. In the past, we have done pulley problems where we assumed the pulley had negligible friction and negligible mass. In that simplified case, the two forces of tension on either side of the pulley would be the same, but that is not the case here. Billy, please keep going. Okay, uh, let's start by summing the torques on the pulley with its, it, its axle as the axis of rotation. Because mass 2 is greater than mass 1, mass 2 should apply a larger torque on the pulley and cause the pulley to rotate in the clockwise or into the board direction. Therefore, let's define clockwise or into the board as positive. Uh, oh, because both forces act on the axis of rotation, neither the force normal nor the force of gravity acting on the pulley will cause a torque on the pulley. Therefore, the net torque equals the torque caused by force of tension 2 minus the torque caused by force of tension 1. And the net torque also equals the rotational inertia of the pulley times the angular acceleration of the pulley. We can substitute the equation for torque, R times force of tension times sine of theta, in for each torque equation with corresponding one and two subscripts. Both R values are equal to the radius of the pulley. Both angles are 90 degrees because both R values are horizontal and both forces of tension are down. The sine of 90 degrees equals one. So we now have pulley radius times force of tension two minus pulley radius times force of tension one equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration. In part A, we are solving for the angular acceleration of the pulley, and in part B, we are solving for both forces of tension. So everything we are solving for is an unknown in this equation. So let's put this equation in our equation holster. Bobby, please continue from here. Well, we've summed the torques, so now let's sum the forces. Let's start with mass 1. The net force on mass 1 in the y direction equals force of tension 1 minus force of gravity 1, which equals mass 1 times acceleration 1. Uh, we can bring force of gravity 1 over to the other side and substitute in mass 1 times acceleration due to gravity. And we now have an equation for the force of tension 1, which we can put in our equation holster. Uh, now let's sum the forces on mass 2 in the y direction. 
Actually, it's the same as what I did with mass one, only replace every one subscript with a two because we are summing the forces on mass two. Why is Mr. P just staring at me? He should, he should be writing on the board. You know, you know, I really don't think you want me to write that on the board yet. I don't? Oh, it's the direction. Uh, I defined the direction of positive torque as clockwise or into the board. So down uh, on the side of the pulley where mass two is, is actually positive, not negative. Yeah, I, I actually made this same mistake the last time we did this. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, then let the net force on mass two equal the negative of force of tension two plus force of gravity two, which equals mass two times acceleration two. Therefore, force of tension two equals mass two times acceleration due to gravity minus mass two times acceleration two. That, that makes more sense. Thanks, Billy. You are welcome, Bobby. Notice I have better identified the direction in which we are summing the forces. We are actually not summing the forces in the y direction, but rather what I call the positive direction. The positive direction is the direction which Billy defined earlier when he defined clockwise or into the board as positive. This means that to the left of the pulley, up is positive, and to the right of the pulley, down is positive. By defining this positive direction, it helps remind us to be careful of direction. But we now have three equations in equation holsters. Please combine them all. Actually, all we need to do is substitute the equations for force of tension one and two into the equation we got from some of the torques. That's all we can really do with that. But what about relating the linear and angular accelerations to one another? Oh yeah, that's right. So when we did the bike wheel example a few lessons ago, you showed us that the linear acceleration of the hanging mass is the same as the tangential acceleration of the rim of the bike wheel, or in this case, the rim of the pulley. So acceleration one equals acceleration two, which equals tangential acceleration or radius times angular acceleration. Because it's the rim of the wheel, the radius is the radius of the pulley. Uh, so we can substitute the pulley radius times angular acceleration for both linear accelerations. Bo, please finish part A. Please find the angular acceleration of the pulley. Okay, um, multiply through by the radius of the pulley, and then move all the terms to the left-hand side, which have angular acceleration in them, so we can factor out angular acceleration on the left-hand side. Uh, and we can factor out an acceleration due to gravity times radius on the right-hand side. Divide the whole equation by everything inside the parentheses on the left-hand side. I suppose we could factor out radius squared from two terms in the denominator, and we get angular acceleration of the pulley equals acceleration due to gravity times pulley radius times the quantity mass 2 minus mass 1, all divided by the quantity rotational inertia plus radius squared squared times the quantity mass 2 plus mass 1. With numbers, that is 9.81 times 0 0.0385 times the quantity 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1, all divided by the quantity 0 0.0137 times 0 0.0385 squared times the quantity 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1, which works out to be 2.67016 or 2.67 radians per second squared with three significant digits. Let's compare this to our measured angular acceleration. The initial angular velocity of the pulley is zero. Change in theta is two revolutions or four pi radians. Change in time is 193 frames at 60 frames per second, or 3.216 repeating seconds. The net torque is constant, so the angular acceleration is constant, so we can use the uniformly angularly accelerated motion equation. Angular displacement equals initial angular velocity times change in time, plus one half angular acceleration times change in time squared. Initial angular velocity is zero, so the angular acceleration equals two times angular displacement divided by change in time squared, or two times four pi divided by 3.216 repeating squared, which equals 2.4290, or 2.43 radians per second squared. 
We can use the relative error equation to solve for our percentage difference with the measured angular acceleration as the observed value and the predicted angular acceleration as the accepted value. We get a percentage difference of negative 9.03%. So our measured angular acceleration was about 9% less than our predicted angular acceleration. Eh, that's pretty close. Uh, Billy, please solve part B. Please solve for the predicted forces of tension. We can use the two equations for forces of tension which are in our equation holsters. Uh, but we can factor out mass and substitute in pulley radius times angular acceleration for linear acceleration in both equations. That means force of tension 1 equals mass 1 times the quantity acceleration due to gravity plus pulley radius times angular acceleration or uh, 0 0.1 times the quantity 9.81 plus 0 0.0385 times 2.67016 or 0 0.991280 or with three significant digits 0 0.991 newtons. Uh, force of tension 2 equals 0 0.2 times the quantity 9.81 uh, minus 0 0.0385 times 2.67016, which is uh, 1.94144 or 1.94 newtons. Now, please notice that those two forces of tension are not equal in magnitude. Recall that is because our pulley has mass and therefore has rotational inertia and therefore requires a net torque to angularly accelerate it. Therefore, in order to cause that net torque on the pulley, force of tension 1 and force of tension 2 cannot have the same magnitude. But if the pulley had negligible mass and therefore negligible rotational inertia, the equation we got from summing the net torque would actually show that the two forces of tension acting on the pulley would be the same. Hold up, Mr. P. You also said the pulley has to have negligible friction. But if the pulley has no friction, then the string would just slide on the pulley and the pulley would never rotate. What's up with that? Interesting point, Bo. So, so what we mean when we say the pulley has negligible friction is that the axle of the pulley has negligible friction. The surface of the pulley still has friction to interact with the string. Okay, I also want to point out two ways which students try to use to solve this problem, which are both incorrect. One is to sum the torques on the whole system all at once with the axis of rotation at the axle of the pulley. It works out to be a pretty long equation, but some students will try to solve it this way. But realize the rotational inertia and angular acceleration on the right-hand side of the equation would then refer to everything in the system, including the two hanging masses. And hopefully you recognize that the hanging masses do not have rotational inertia, nor do they have angular acceleration. So this equation is incorrect. Another way students try to solve this all at once is to sum the forces on the entire system in the positive direction. Again, this is a pretty long equation, and again, it does not work. This time it is because the mass times acceleration on the right-hand side of the equation would be for the entire system. Now, I do understand that the rim of the pulley does have the same magnitude tangential acceleration as the linear acceleration of the two masses. However, the pulley itself does not have a single tangential acceleration because the tangential acceleration depends on radius. The larger the radius, the larger the tangential acceleration of whatever specific point on the pulley you are referring to. So that equation does not work either. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.